Well, our text this evening is found in 1 John, uh, verse 1 and verse 6. Let me read it uh, to you this evening. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice uh, the truth. In this section between verses 5 to verses, verses 10, we have couplets. There are positives, and we saw that last week, and there are also negatives, and verse 6 is a negative. And uh, by, win- by way of introduction uh, this evening, uh, John continues this theme of light and darkness. And the positive from um, last Sunday evening was to be found in 1 John verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But John continues this theme of light and darkness when we get to verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, let me remind you of what I said last Sunday evening, and that is this concept of light and of darkness really comes from uh, Greek thought, Greek philosophy. Uh, Yet there is a biblical side to this when we talk in terms of sin and wickedness and evil, and the opposite to that, of course, is godliness, holiness, and Christ-likeness. And John is concerned about the the world that he's living in and the the new church, the early church, is is having to exist in in relation to the darkness of the world, its sinfulness, its ungodlinesses, and the light that has come into the church through Jesus, uh, the light of the world. And so he wants to develop that, uh, but he's mindful that the people that he's going to be writing to uh, are are going to be a mixture of peoples. They're going to be uh, people who are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. They may be those who are seeking and wondering if the truth of Christ is real. And there are going to be others who will distort uh, the gospel in some way. And throughout the the book uh, of 1 John, uh, John is constantly comes back to that theme uh, that of, the, of, of people trying to distort the good news. Now, he's able to lay down an authority because he is the last of the apostles. He was one of the twelve. He was there with Jesus and all those miracles. He can declare, as he does in the verse, first verse, that he was there uh, and heard and he had seen and he had looked upon and his hands had handled, he had heard Uh, what Jesus was saying. But let's go to uh, that verse 6 now. And verse uh, verse 6, and the first part part of verse 6, which is where John says, if we say, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So the first point is to Emphasize those three words, if we say. John has in mind a congregation. As he's writing this letter, he perhaps has in mind a congregation. He's perhaps thinking of himself as being a pastor and looking uh, at the congregation before him. Perhaps he is mindful of the time when he was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. We are thinking of of John at this time as, uh, as a man who is now perhaps in, in his 80s, 90s even, and perhaps no longer able to stand and preach and do what he used to be able to do, but he can still write. And so in his mind he has this uh, picture of the people that will be reading the letter, uh, the sermon that he's preaching, if you like, from this uh, in his letter here. And perhaps as he looks out, as it were, upon this congregation, there would be many people who would be listening to him, many people who would be thinking that they are believers in Jesus. But perhaps like every pastor who preaches to his congregation, 
John also knows that there are, there are some there who are not true believers, who haven't got a true understanding of the gospel, haven't got a true faith or trust in the Lord Jesus. As an ex illustration of that, an example of that, I remember some time ago uh, doing a hospital visit and coming across a lady in the hospital who was filling in a form because she was going to have a serious operation. And it was one of those forms where you had to put your name and address and a tablet you were on. And one of the questions were, and I'm not sure it, it, it's true today, but it was then, that the, one of the questions was, what, what is your religion? And I, I guess it was about the chaplaincy, you know, were you a Protestant or a Roman Catholic or a JW or whatever you were. And she said to me, what am I? And she said that because she didn't, didn't want to write down atheists because well, she had a kind of vague idea that God exists. She was definitely more Protestant than Roman Catholic. Um, she definitely didn't want to be, think, be thought of as a Muslim or, or Jewish. So what am I? So I tried to explain to her about the Christian gospel. And I said, if you really believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you could put down evangelical believer in Jesus or something like that. But what she put, put down was C of V. And I thought, well, maybe that just covered all the bases for her uh, in that. But many people in the community in which we live uh, can often think that they are Christians. And sometimes the only reason why they think they're Christians is because they're not living in, in India. And if you were living in India, you might be a Hindu. Or if you were living in... Um, uh, some far eastern country, you might be a Buddhist. And because we live in, in Britain, well, people think, oh, well, I must be a Christian. Because people don't really want to be seen as not believing in something. I think it's still a bit of a stigma if someone is prepared to stand up and say that they're an atheist. And very often, we don't want to be this or we don't want to be that, so we'll, we'll put the word Christian because that sort of covers our sort of community, our society in which we live. Now, in John's day, um, there were people who were, I suppose we might say, infiltrating the church. And they were called Gnostics. We're going to hear a lot about the Gnostics throughout this letter. Uh, they called themselves Christians. They said that they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they didn't behave as Christians. They weren't walking in the light of God's word. And they tended to walk in darkness. Now, who were these Gnostic people? They were the people who sort of had a mixture of the Greek philosophy of the day and also of the Christian faith. And they somehow merged it all together. And in their view, the Gnostics thought in terms of the spiritual um, soul of a person as being pure and holy and clean. And what you did in your physical life didn't really matter because the body was evil. And so therefore, you can do whatever you like with your physical body in this life because your spirit would always be pure and clean. And I think this is part of what John is writing about when he says that if we say that we have fellowship uh, with him, and walking darkness, we lie and uh, do not practice the truth. If we say, this is, what Paul's, this is what John says in verse 6, if we say, it really is a call to examine ourselves. Are we truly believers in the Lord Jesus? If I am a Christian, if I'm a true believer in the Lord Jesus, What's the proof that I am a Christian? Well, John, through this letter, is going to give us a lot of proofs and a lot of different kinds of proofs. But the first proof he wants to give to us is here in verse 6. And it's about, and this is our second point, fellowshipping with God. So our second point, we have fellowship with him. So let's go back to our text there if we say that we have fellowship with him. 
One of the marks of being Christian is that we say we have a relationship with Jesus. We have a fellowship with God the Father. But what is fellowship? Well, I'm going to give a few definitions in a moment, but let's go back to the early part of the chapter and to verse 3. 1 John 1 verse 3 says this, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to be totally Trinitarian, we should say fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's the Trinitarian position, isn't it? But the point is this, that you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are uh, connected with God. Uh, we often say about a, a union with Christ in these matters. Uh, that there's a fellowshipping with uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And fellowship is with a person. In fact, we can say this because we were good Trinitarians here this evening, can't we? That God is one, but he's three persons, three in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And our fellowship is with the three persons of the Trinity. And fellowship uh, means intimate, uh, intimate, a close uh, sharing with the full light of God's presence. Okay, I've got a few problems with that word. It just came, hasn't, it wasn't working this evening. Fellowship, fellowship me, means having something in common with someone. That's an ordinary definition about fellowship. But if you're a Christian and you're brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you have in common? Well, the answer is you have Jesus in common, don't you? We have Jesus as part of why we fellowship with God and why we are able to fellowship with one another. It, it means being in, in harmony with God. A joined... Uh, and connected with God in what we do. It means, it means recognizing what I call the, 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 the three S's. Recognizing our sinfulness, that we are sinners. Recognizing our Savior, that he is the only one who could save us from our sins. And then recognizing our salvation, that all of our salvation is not about us, not of us, but of Christ. One uh, particular commentator, a man called Stephen Kistermarker, who's an American, says this, the sinner who refuses to set his life in harmony with God's will cannot claim to have fellowship with God. And that's what these Gnostics were doing. They weren't uh, setting their life in harmony with God's will, in harmony with God's word. They, they were thinking that the Bible now was sort of irrelevant to them. They had this special experience, this special um, mystical uh, uh, encounter with God, and that made them so far above everybody else. And they could do whatever they wanted in their life, because it didn't matter, because the body was evil, but as long as the, the, soul, the soul was pure. They claimed to know, to know God in a better way. In fact, Paul ran into a, a few of these characters in 2 Corinthians, and he, he spoke of them as uh, thinking to themselves as the super apostles and claiming to be far above and superior to anybody else because they had this special knowledge of God. And these were the kind of people that, that John is, is thinking of when he's writing about these people who, who say that they have a fellowship with God, but they're walking in darkness. So, by application, the call then to us is to examine our own lives and to, to ask ourselves the question, is the life that we live in harmony with God's word? Is it in harmony with the God we, we say we love and the Lord Jesus Christ whom we confess? Is that true of us? Or are we guilty, perhaps, of being a bit of a hypocrite, saying one thing with our lips, or possibly even thinking something in our minds, but doing the very opposite in our lives. So that was our second point. 
as we go through this text uh, this evening, that if we have fellowship with him, and that is what we are if we're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a fellowship with Jesus. But our third point is to continue this text, because if we have fellowship with him, but then if we're doing something else, if we walk in darkness, we lie. 1 John 1 verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. You see, there are some people who know that they are not really Christians, but they pretend to be so. And as a result of that, they lie, and they're lying against God. One of the saddest times in my pastoral ministry was uh, a situation where a young man and a young woman uh, were very much in love, and they were thinking about marriage. But when I explored it a bit with the two people, I discovered, in fact, that the young man, in order to get close to this young woman, who had told him that she was not going to marry anybody unless they were a Christian, because she was a believer, had said he was a Christian. But he wasn't a Christian. And indeed, he told me so uh, some, some days later that he wasn't. He was pretending to be a Christian. He was going to church. He was coming out with the, the kind of vocabulary that Christians have in order to try to impress this young lady about how much he loved her. Well, he loved her. I have no doubt about that, but he didn't love Jesus, and that was the big problem. But a lot of people also say that they're Christians, but they're doing it out of ignorance because they don't really know what, a being, a, what being a Christian is all about. Perhaps they've been told that they're a Christian. And sometimes it comes down just simply to this, that they've been told that they're a Christian because they're not a Muslim or they're not a Buddhist or they're not a Hindu or they're not an atheist, so therefore you must be a Christian. And some people would take that just like that, without having any idea or understanding what being a Christian is. Some people might say, well, I'm a Christian because, as far as I understand it, the Christian faith is all about trying to be good and doing good. But that's not the Christian faith, is it? That's not what being a Christian really is all about. And some people, I had a brother-in-law like this uh, for a while, and uh, he thought he was a Christian because he went to church, and when he was 14, the pastor came up to him and said, well, you've been in this church now, and you're 14, it's time to be baptized and become a member of the church. And because he'd been baptized and been going to church, and he was in the young people's work, and the pastor had told him it was, it was about time he was baptized, he thought he was a Christian. Well, that's not being a Christian, is it? That's living a lie. And some people, and this is a problem in South Wales Valley chapels, is that uh, sometimes, and people have said this to me in the past, that they're a Christian <laughs> because dad was a deacon in the church or granddad was a, the pastor of the church. Well, that's not being a Christian at all, is it? So what is it to be a Christian? It's an acknowledgement of our sin, the acknowledgement that we are sinful and we are sinners. It's a realizing that we need someone to deal with our sinfulness, pay for our sins, so we need a savior who can do it because we can't save ourselves. And remember how Paul put it there in Ephesians chapter 2, not of works, he says, lest anyone should boast. It's about believing Jesus to be that one saviour, the only saviour, and be able to be that saviour because he's truly man, a real man, and truly God. And coming to Jesus in repentance, crying out to him in prayer, crying out to God in prayer, uh, wanting to be forgiven of those, those sins, wanting to turn away from those sins that mar and 
hinder any relationship with God. And then believing. And believing is having faith and trusting in Jesus, isn't it? To believe what, that Jesus is who he says he is. And Jesus did what he said he would do. He would be the saviour. He would be the lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. But there are people, and we've just pointed this out, there are people who walk in darkness and what they're doing, maybe they're doing it deliberately, like that young man, or maybe it's doing out of ignorance, but it's living a lie. But then John adds something else to our text, and uh, it's, it's the word truth. Have I missed something? No, I haven't. <laughs> yes, I have. I just wanted to quote this text before we move on to the next point, and that's just a reminder to us that uh, what it is to be a Christian. It is to have and to know that the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all sins. It's 1 John 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, it's one of the positives, because I said that John, through this section, 5 to 10, has negatives and positives. Well, the negative was verse 6, positive, and we'll see that next time. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. What is, it, what is it to be a Christian? It is to have that, not only knowledge, but that knowing of Jesus in our hearts and be able to say from the depth of our being that the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all sin. Well, let's bring our fourth point in, which is where John adds another word to our text. So, and that's the word is truth. Uh, 1 John 1, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie, and says John, and do not practice the truth. If we walk in darkness, as John has been telling us, then we are out of sync with God. We're not in harmony with God's will, what God wants us to do. We are not practicing the truth. But we can ask a question. What is truth? That was a tremendous question that Pilate asked, but he wasn't prepared to really take on board the answer to that. So perhaps we can put another question, try to answer that, and say, where do I find truth? That's a question that in our modern day and age, I think a lot of people are asking, you know, what is really true? What's fake news? What is real? And lots of people are very skeptical and perhaps about all kinds of things that are going on in the world, but where do we find truth? Well, two things. We find it in Christ. That's the first thing. We find it in Jesus. And we can quote Jesus himself here, can't we? John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, one of his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the truth. That's what Jesus says he is, isn't he? And I think I've said this often, but if you take the Greek of that text, it's an emphatic statement. And you could translate it like this. Jesus saying, I am. I am the way. I am I am the truth. I am, I am the life. And we should finish the verse, shouldn't we? No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the truth. Jesus is the truth, and no one can come to heaven, no one can have eternal life except through Jesus, except through him. But then we can also say this, that truth is God's word. Truth is God's word. And Jesus' words again. Now in John 17 verse 17, this is the prayer. This is a prayer that Jesus prayed and he's praying to the Father and he says about his disciples indeed he's really generalizing and praying to all his disciples of every generation, of every age, sanctify them by truth by your truth your word is true is truth. Your word 
is truth. The scriptures are true. What is truth? Where can I find truth? Where's the foundation of truth? It is in Jesus and it is in the word of God, the scriptures. And if we're wanting to walk in harmony with God and not in darkness, then what we need to be do, doing is seeking to be Christ-like in our lives. And if you want to be Christ-like in our lives, we go to the scriptures. We go and find out what Jesus was like, what Jesus did on earth, what Jesus said, how he was, how he, he dealt with sinners, how he dealt with the hypocrites. To practice the truth is to live out God's word, to seek to be more Christ-like in our life, is to live out what God wants us to be and do in the power of himself and of the Holy Spirit. So let's go back to our, our text again. Uh, 1 John 1 and verse 6, and there we read uh, these words once more. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Think of the positive to that. If we have fellowship with him, we don't walk in the darkness, we walk in the light because Jesus is the light of the world. And we put into practice in our lives the truth which we find in the word of God. Let's bow our heads uh, Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these positives and these negatives that John is giving to us in this chapter. We thank you, Lord, for the proof that we are yours. If we, when we know that we have a fellowship with you and we know that we are walking in the light of your word. And in this dark world in which we live, we want to give you praise and thanks that Jesus himself is the light of the world. And we, we pray that we might point to Jesus, to Jesus being the light, to Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, and to Jesus being the only name that is given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And Father, we thank you for your touch upon us. Thank you that you have guided us and guarded us to that point where we, we can say that we have a fellowship with you and that we're not walking in darkness, we're walking in your light. And we pray, Father, that what we are and who we are may become even more evident in our lives and in our dealings with men and women and boys and girls so that they may see not us but see Jesus in us, shining forth and that they themselves may respond to that and desire and want to come to a real faith in Jesus. So we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.